So what exactly is inherited? Well, the focus in determining this has been on personality. And probably the best known approach in this area is that of Hans Einzink. His theory of criminal behavior tries to combine biological, social, and individual factors in accounting for criminality. He proposed that children learn not to behave antisocially through processes of conditioning during socialization. So essentially the child is conditioned to learn right from wrong, to learn that doing wrong things results in punishment, and so to learn what to do to avoid punishment. The idea here is that ultimately the child comes to control their own impulses. But Isaac suggested that some children are easier to condition than others. So, he originally proposed that there were two main personality dimensions, extroversion and neuroticism. And later he added a third dimension of psychoticism and generated the Penn model. Now this is a structural model of personality where these dimensions are higher order theoretical constructs that emerge out of lower level facets for each dimension. So people high in extroversion are characterized by sociability, liveliness, activity, assertiveness, dominance, and venturesomeness. Isaac theorized that those higher in extroversion had lower levels of spontaneous cortical arousal in the reticular activating center of the brainstem, and so sought excitement to increase their arousal levels to what would be normal for a person with a lower level of extroversion. Now, Isaac once believed criminals to be higher in extroversion than non-offenders, but later he revised that view. Isaac's omnibus dimension in neuroticism addresses the continuum and control of emotions, where people higher in neuroticism are more emotionally unstable, and those lower in neuroticism are less variable in their moods. People higher in neuroticism are tense, unstable, guilt-ridden, emotional, and negative, whereas persons lower in neuroticism are the opposite. But being low in neuroticism, however, is not necessarily a virtue. If it operates in conjunction with higher psychoticism or psychopathy, then that person may behave antisocially and not care about the implications to themselves or others. Now, Kale published a meta-analysis of Isaac's Penn model in relation to antisocial behavior. And this consisted of 52 studies with 97 samples. And Kale concluded that psychoticism was more strongly related to antisocial behavior, with neuroticism also linked, but with that relationship between neuroticism and antisocial behavior being weaker than that observed between psychoticism and antisocial behavior. In contrast, the effect of extroversion on antisocial behavior was minor. This suggests that Isaac's dimensions of psychoticism and neuroticism most contribute to our understanding of antisocial behavior. Interestingly, after the 1970s, personality explanations for crime largely fell out of favor. In a paper published in 2014, Rawdon and McConnell suggest that despite a number of analyses showing the superiority of personality predictors in terms of predicting crime over environmental factors, the emphasis in research switched to focus on environmental factors that impact on crime. The reason for this, of course, is that environmental factors are potentially modifiable, whereas personality is not. So, following on from Isaac's work, Rawdon and McConnell picked up on a suggestion from Farrington and Welsh, who noted in a paper that was published in 2007 that the Big Five personality model has rarely been related to offending. Now, the Big Five are agreeableness, and that's characterized by someone so being good-natured, trustful, and cooperative. Conscientiousness, someone who is responsible, orderly, and dependable. Openness, someone who is an intellectual, polished, and independent-minded. And neuroticism and extroversion. So, agreeableness and conscientiousness typically negatively relate to offending behavior, while neuroticism and extroversion are thought to positively relate, with openness having no relationship. So, they looked at the big five alongside socio-demographic variables commonly considered in relation to offending, and they did this in a nationally representative sample. So specifically, they drew data from the National Child Development Study that sampled all the children born on one particular week in the UK in 1958. So they had a sample of over 17,000 children. Now, data in the study is being collected in sweeps with different constructs assessed at different times. So, in relation to this study, they got data on criminal justice sanctions where the participants were 42 years of age. So, specifically, they assessed whether they've received a police warning, a caution, whether they'd been arrested and or found guilty of a criminal offence in the last 10 years. 
at age 50, they assess the big five factors. In terms of socio-demographic features like gender, birth weight, family size, social class of male head of household, social status of respondents, and whether the person had problems at school, these were assessed when the participant was 33 years old, when their highest educational qualification was assessed at age 50. Now the final data set comprised responses for 8,550 participants. 14% of their sample had criminal justice sanctions imposed on them between the age of 32 and 42. So it's important to note here that potentially there's a lot of early offending being omitted. That is, offences are committed when the people were young. Now, researchers conducted logistic regression analysis with the outcome variable criminal justice sanctions imposed. And overall, the model was significant. The predictors accounted for approximately 9% of the variance in criminal justice sanction. And the significant predictors were gender, school problems, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, and conscientiousness. So, there was a high probability of obtaining a criminal justice sanction if you were male versus female, if you had more school problems during your teenage years, if you were higher in extroversion, and if you were lower in agreeableness, emotional stability, and conscientiousness. The other constructs assessed were not significantly associated with the outcome variable. And the authors concluded that failing to take into account personality traits in assessing individual criminal involvement is a major oversight. They have a role to play even when the effect of socio-economic variables are taken into account. So personality is a factor, and perhaps a bigger factor than the socio-demographic features assessed in the last study. But what else contributes to criminality? Is there something about the family environment that these people grow up in? Now, obviously, we've already touched on this in relation to Kendler and colleague studies published in 2014 that focused on the disruption of the adopted child's parent-child relationship through divorce, illness, or death. But what else has been thought to contribute?